okay um, and you know my colleagues uh, can wear the mask if they want to as someone else said that was a joke okay so yeah as I said this is the uh, first time we're doing this uh, data science Hong Kong is a attempt to make a data science community here in Hong Kong right so we don't have um, as much data science going on in the rest of the world but there's no reason for that to be the case we have a lot of very talented data scientists and, and similar um, roles here in Hong Kong so uh, we run events uh, quite often go to our website datasciencehongkong.com to see some of the recent events uh, we have a forum uh, I think I put the link in the description <clears throat> and uh, it's also available on the main website, the link, discourse.datasciencehongkong.com. Well, of course, we have all the usual social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Meetup. We should probably do a Telegram group. I understand that's popular nowadays, too. All right, so feel free to uh, to help out, to volunteer, if you want uh, to see more data science events or if you want to talk about anything you're working on, either for work uh, or for fun please do get in touch all right so yeah let's begin um, plan is for this to be an hour and a half I'm going to talk for half an hour I definitely the least expert out of the uh, three people we have today <clears throat> I'm just going to show um, how to get some data and not use Excel I understand that some data science communities in Hong Kong uh, love having events about Excel that's great I know a lot of people use Excel but how can we go beyond that, right? So that's what I'm going to show using R to get data and then uh, draw pretty graphs. Okay, and then the more interesting talks will be after that. We have uh, Dr. Scott Edmonds, who's an expert at genetics, uh, works with BGI, and he's going to talk about um, how to use the genetic data that's out there already to understand more about the evolution uh, of this virus quite interesting stuff actually and then lastly we're very very fortunate to have Professor uh, Benjamin Cowling uh, planning it to be at 1 p.m. so in about an hour um, he's uh, part of the HKU team that published the uh, already seminal New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, that talks about the um, transmission dynamics of this virus he's put some slides together and he will share that with us later we're really very lucky to have them much more much more interesting than, than I will be but until then you have me okay so uh, unlike the other two who I'm sure have prepared wonderful slides and demos I've decided to uh, or at least I'm justifying my decision to be lazy I'm going to do my session without any planning whatsoever all I've done is to find the data sources and we'll go through them together in the next 25 minutes just to show what is possible very easily with a little bit of scripting in R in my case or you could use Python if you prefer okay let me just make sure that everything's functioning <laughs> very slow is my speaking very slow or uh, let me see audio is fine that's good and someone even likes my picture woohoo Scott is ready to be added 12.30. Thank you so much for joining us, Scott. I will add you at 12.30. I feel like a, I feel like a DJ. Just put on some nice music. All right, so let's begin, right? So I'm going to show um, something I came across a couple of days ago. So please tell me if you can see the uh, Twitter, um, the tweet, as it's called in front of you. So yes, this is in Chinese, but uh, even for non-Chinese speakers, it should be pretty easy to understand what this says. Basically, this tweet claims that the official statistics around the death rate from coronavirus are a little bit doctored because it seems to be 2.1 percent every single day this tweet um, seems to be quite popular it's had 3,000 retweets um, and <clears throat> 6,000 likes right now yes even if you don't speak don't read Chinese rather <clears throat> 2.1% every single day, the death rate, right? This is death. And these are the confirmed cases, I guess. <clears throat> wow, 2.1% every single day. That is quite ridiculous, isn't it? So I'm quite interested in this. Now, I haven't actually looked into this. I was waiting for this uh, opportunity to do so. Let's do it together. Hopefully, 
I will be able to achieve something before 12.30. But first thing I want to mention is that later on, someone actually took these numbers, I guess stuck in the calculator, and assuming they're the same numbers, not quite 2.1%, right? A little bit of variation there, maybe not much of a variation, but still somewhat of a variation there. So that's the first thing to point out, okay. But you know, in this day and age of fake news, what? You know, <laughs> are these numbers even the same as the ones at the top? I really don't know. How about this? How about we go to a trusted source, get the numbers for ourselves, do the calculation ourselves. No need to rely on Twitter. All right. So like I said, this is completely unrehearsed. I have about 20 minutes. Let's go for it. All right. So first of all, I put in the forum some links uh, to data that we have, which I've come across. If you have any other interesting data sources, please, please add them. So for example, here, there's this very cool Hong Kong uh, data. Of course, we only have uh, around 20 cases or so. Hopefully, it doesn't increase too much in the near future. Um, <clears throat> And I'm sure a lot of you have come across this dashboard from, from John Hopkins. Let's uh, let's just show it quickly, why not? I didn't plan to, but this is all unplanned anyway, isn't it, my session? If it loads. <clears throat> Hopefully it doesn't crash my computer. Okay. I think you've all seen this by now, right? So this is showing the number of cases uh, by country slash region. This is a new addition here. On the left-hand side, we have Others, which is uh, a cruise ship. <laughs> there have been 61 cases on a cruise ship, and it's now the uh, the highest uh, number of confirmed cases after China. It's not even a United Nations member. Yes, yeah, so someone else has complained about the, the old deal. Unfortunately, I have absolutely no idea why the right side is uh, not working. Let me check that. This is why I need a proper millennial. Uh, let me see. Input. Um, seems to be... Is it better now? Can you hear me now? <clears throat> I, I don't know why it's... Uh, I think just genuinely the the, the one, one side of my laptop is, is broken. I Also, when I listen to music, I can only hear one side. So I do apologize for that. You just have to listen more carefully with your left ear. I do apologize. All right. So anyway, so you see this. Now... Again, we can, if we trust these guys, and you know, I don't see why not. This is a prestigious university in the United States. How about we take this raw data? And you see here at the bottom, they do link to their Google Sheet and their time series table. Okay, and actually, uh, it's also mentioned here at the bottom of this very nice web page, which has lots of uh, links and descriptions and so on. They update it quite often. Genetic stuff too. Very cool stuff indeed. I highly recommend this page. <clears throat> Okay, so I've actually already brought up the spreadsheets that I mentioned. Um, so here's the sheet, one sheet they give. So this is actually a, a Google spreadsheet. And just like uh, Excel, it has different tabs, in this case, for different dates, right? So you can see the uh, numbers for regions or countries uh, for each, each snapshot of time, right? So this is the latest snapshot, 3.40 p.m., on the 8th of February, and you can go backwards like this. And that, that's great, right? These are the sort of numbers we want. Um, but it's a bit tricky that they're in different tabs. So there's another sheet that they made um, with the same data, I assume, where the times are actually put in uh, as the columns. <laughs> I don't know why the video is not showing, it was not showing for you. I'll try not to change the video too often. That could be, that could be why. At least I can see it. Uh, I guess that's what matters. And I'm happy to share all these resources, of course, uh, afterwards. Okay, so what we can see on the screen in front of us, hopefully you can see it too, is now that we have three tabs, confirmed, recovered, and death. And we have the times here instead across the columns, right? So what we could do is we can actually import this data into our preferred statistical uh, programming language. Okay, the tweet was a while ago. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, import this data into R and then we can draw some lovely graphs and then we can also uh, calculate if the death rate is indeed seems to be the same every single day. All right, so all I've done for now is 
to download the data. That's all I've done. Okay, just to show how easy it is. So there's a library. This is in R, by the way. Uh, oh, let me switch to uh, let me switch to R. Okay, don't think you want to see a. Uh, you're going to see me. <laughs> But here I am talking in the bottom right-hand corner. So hopefully you should be able to see uh, our studio now on your screen. This is uh, my preferred environment to do uh, data analysis. All right. So as I've said, I haven't really practiced this at all, just to show what is possible. Okay, so <clears throat> all I've done is get the URLs. There's actually uh, secret ways of getting data out of the... Google Sheets, uh, you, uh, you will have to go to uh, Stack Overflow to find out how to do this. But basically for each tab, you can see uh, different URLs, confirmed, recovered, and death. Okay, so let's load up the Tidyverse library. Okay, and then we just download the three data sets. Okay, we let it automatically try and work out. Let's see. <clears throat> let me just close them. So, Okay, so let's look, for example, at what it got for confirmed. Okay, so you can see that the column names have mostly been imported, for some reason not for uh, the date here and the latitude and longitude. I, I don't really understand why not. Um, and actually, what are what are these numbers? Let me see. Uh, oh, that's the first confirmed date. Yeah, not that interesting. And then the rest of it, we have the uh, date and time of the update in the column, right? So we start with 21st of, Fe um, 21st of January, rather, at 10 p.m. This is the American style of dates. Okay, wonderful, right? Now, <clears throat> in order to be able to graph this data, we actually want one value per row. And here we have many, many values per row, right? Each value being associated with different dates. So we need to uh, just reshape the data in order to do that. Um, now, it should be very easy. So he says, so let's call this confirmed tidy, all right? Um, what we're doing is we're going to reshape the data, okay? So this is called gathering the data. We take our confirmed data frame and we we say, well, the columns we're taking, uh, we're going to take all the columns, sorry. We're going to take all the columns from the sixth column onwards, right? Let me just check that all the way to the end, yep they will become uh, a value in a new column called daytime. We will keep the other five columns, right? So, so what are the values that we want to take? We want to take um, all the columns that are not... <clears throat> Let me just see, I always get this wrong around. <laughs> uh, actually, I did this earlier. Yeah, so we just gather, as I thought. Okay, so let's put here. So we want the first column all the way to the fifth column, which has a proper name. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so this is actually the key. Oops. Right, because this is what each column is going to have. And Okay, let's just test this. Uh, ah, like this, okay. Right, so <clears throat> I forgot the syntax. So the first value is going to be the, the new column name. And then, uh, obviously the values, let's try that. Okay, so now we'll do is we see we've still got the first five columns. Then now we've got the, t t uh, you know, when the update was in this column. So obviously we we'll repeat it multiple times. And then we have the value we want. So this is, in this case, the number of confirmed cases. Okay, so let's say we want to plot um, 
how many confirmed cases there are over time uh, for Hubei, right? So I actually did this earlier as well. So let's just copy that. <clears throat> Idea for dead people, but let's start with the confirmed cases. Okay, so what we're doing here is taking the confirmed number of cases. We we'll say we want only where the province or state is Hubei, right? And we're going to do a point uh, for every uh, time and date and value. Yeah, you don't need my webcam, do you? Let me get rid of this. All right. Okay, so of course I will assure the resources after the talk. I want you to listen to me first. <laughs> All right. So, as you can see here, the number of cases seems to be following some sort of uh, exponential curve, give or take, um, over time, right? For example, if you want to make a line, Very beautiful, right? A little bit uh, jagged. Okay. <clears throat> okay, great. Now, as we've already got about 10 minutes left, let's start, let's try and find the answer we're looking for earlier, right? So the way to do this is to uh, is to combine our data frames together, right? So for example, for the number of confirmed cases, we add uh, a new column, um, confirmed, right? Okay, so you see all of these are confirmed cases over time for different uh, regions and so on. <clears throat> okay, we do the same for the other two, recovered, ID covered. Well, I don't think we'll use the recover, right? Because we want to calculate the death rate. But nonetheless, okay, and let's do the same for dead. And we're unfortunately, dead. All right. So let's just check. <clears throat> okay, so of course, initially there are many values. Okay, then down to the bottom we have a lot more. All right. <clears throat> okay, so now we can combine the, the data sets together. Let's call them all tidy. Oops. So we use uh, our bind. Uh, let's call it our bind list. So let's just do the confirmed and the uh, dead. Oh, should we use bind rows instead? Does matter. All right, let's have a look. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the two data sets together. Right, we have the dead and we have the confirmed. Now remember, we want one k one uh, number um, per row, right? So let's put the so in this case we want the death rate. So let's move the confirmed uh, or dead into uh, two different columns, right? Instead of one column. So now we do the opposite of gather. We do uh, all tidy spread. Oops. Take the all tidy. Okay. No shame in looking at the help file. Okay, so we're spreading a key value pair across multiple columns, right? So the key in this case is the ones that we want to uh, make into new columns. <coughs> um, okay.
uh, let me see. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we want to take, let me see. Okay, so I've got type is the key. Okay, so you see now we have confirmed and spread in two different columns. Okay, so now very easy to just add a new column. In fact, we can just do it here. Let's call it death rate. We want to do the dead divided by confirmed, I guess, right? Like that's what that tweet was doing. Okay, so we can see the death rate here. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna plot a few of these death rates. Okay, so let's just do it for Hubei in the meantime. Okay, so this time we want to take all tidy spread. All right for Hubei, we want to do it across time. Oops, not this one. Okay, we want to do the death rate. Mm -hmm. Nothing seems to have come out. Let's just let's try and see what's going on. Okay. Ah, where's the where's the number of dead gone? Ah down here I see uh, it's at different times ah that's strange did they put them at different times okay it looks they look the same to me oh. okay this one was when I don't practice <laughs> first all right <clears throat> um, let me see so when I combine them, let's change the uh, time date into this. Ah, that doesn't work. They should have combined together. Let me see. Uh, maybe I should have joined. Yeah, it's okay. Well, here you see this is the same value, right? So, this when this spread, this should have. We kept the same. Hmm. Mysterious. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on this while we get a different person to speak. <laughs> but I'll get working and then we'll find out if the 2.1% is a real rate or not. But you can see how easy it is to import the data yourself. You don't have to rely on Twitter. Okay, I'm really glad that the streaming is better now. Okay, so let's uh, let's see if Scott is on the line, so we can start introducing him. Let me see. So please hold. We'll have Scott Edmonds in about five minutes, and we'll have the results of my analysis, <laughs> hopefully by the end of the session. While wow. these two far more intelligent gentlemen than me give their presentations.
Okay, hi Scott. Is that going too fast or? Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, there were problems during Ebola. Um, it got better at, towards the end of the crisis, and um, uh, with, with you know with this, uh, but this issue seemed to have come up again um, uh, in in 2019, 2020. Um, there were at the at the beginning of January, um, there were public appeals from the head of the Wellcome Trust um, that uh, data seemed to be going into uh, publications. Um, but there hadn't been any public data released at that point, so um, he, he, they, you know, they actually then made this kind of public. I don't know how much, how long uh, these discussions were going on privately before then, but then uh, the next day, the day after, public data came out. Um, the uh, Fudan and China CDC released first sequence, and at the same time, uh, HKU and the Shenzhen. HKU Hospital released um, a data set. So we finally had public genomics data from this crisis in, uh, in, in sort of 11th, 12th of January, which was great. So there may have been like a few days delay or a week or so, but you know, compared to SARS where it was months and months and months, um, th things have improved. Like a week could have made a big, like you know, a week can make a big difference in a, in a crisis like this, but I think things are better. Um, so when you have the sequence, what like what can you actually do with it? Like so, um, the first really really um, crucial thing you can do once you have uh, uh, the genome of a, of a of a pathogen of an organism like this is um, you can build diagnostic tests. So the most simple one um, is a PCR um, polymer polymerase chain reaction. Very simple molecular bi biological technique. Because this is an RNA virus, you have you have to do a reverse transcriptase there, and to make it super accurate, you need to make it quantitative. So you put little um, glowing probes. But basically, it's a pretty standard technique. Very everybody has these machines to once you have made short primers based on unique sequences that you need the you know the genome to kind of figure out. Um, you can make a really cool, quick assay. It takes about three hour, two or three hours. You get the result. And um, everybody has these machines. It's very you can very easily standardize it. So you know where we were in an information vacuum with the with the disease. Now we have a tool to actually just show this person has it, this person doesn't have it. That makes a massive difference. Um, so and these new open uh, methodologies, people share these primers on the internet openly. Um, people can compare and test them, and this uh, great website, protocols.io, um, is, is a has become a great forum for people sharing these things. Um, so, uh, you know, this is the third version of a RT-PCR uh, protocol that some virologists in Australia have posted, but it wasn't as sensitive as they would have liked. They found somebody at another group did a much better one, so now after three attempts, they're like saying, use this one, so it's become Kind of social network for um, people comparing and contrasting and validating these things. The uh, sequencing and sequencing protocols are also here, so this has become a, like a fantastic forum um, on a bigger scale. So my, uh, you know, wearing a, wearing my um, declaring conflicts of interest hat, my uh, BGI who runs my journal, they've basically done this on a massive scale. Um, the uh, BGI founder here, Wang Jian, um, uh, dubbed the Elon Musk of China by by some, has actually on New Year's Day bombed it to Wuhan, and they basically built labs scaling up production of these primers. Um, in five days, they built a, a lab that can test 10,000 patients a day, um, and shipping uh, hundreds of thousands of these um, all around, um, all around, uh, all around China and the world. Um, 
So the next uh, and a bit more complicated thing you do can do with this sequencing data is genomic epidemiology. Um, this has really been um, uh, on, on, a, on a really cool data site level, uh, uh, really been uh, aided by this uh, tool, Next Strain. It won the um, Welcome and uh, NIH Open Science Prize. Um, very, very cool tool that I will uh, show you shortly. Um, but basically, it's using the kind of public data streams, builds um, fantastic uh, visualized, um, fantastic visualized uh, uh, phylog phylogenetic genetic trees. It's open source. It's all in Python. It basically has two modules. Um, this auger tool takes uh, sequences and sort of makes this annotated phylogeny, and then this this tool displays it in an interactive web-based, um, you know, D3GS uh, visualization that you can kind of interact with. It's very, very cool. So the current data sources, you, you know, the original, uh, going back to the 80s, NCBI, um, the original one uh, from NCBI uh, has, has got a lot of this data. It's basically where stuff goes just before it's published. But the real kind of real-time uh, data stream, uh, uh, this GISAID EpiFlu uh, database is where most of the community is sticking their stuff. There's also Viper and then the, um, a few Chinese ones. So um, is it OK if I go to do some very quick demos now? Because I can show you. Let's see if this works. I can show you the, um, let me. All right, is this working? So here are all of the NCBI uh, data sets. So currently there's about 48 in GenBank. The RefSeq is the kind of uh, main reference that people have decided upon. So let's look at this GISAID. What's a GISAID, it, the advantage of it is academics are a bit less scared of publishing it in there because it needs a, it requires a login and um, uh, you, you have to kind of vow that you won't kind of publish other people's data until they've already published it. There's about 300,000 viruses in here. If you go to the coronavirus, the latest update is 78. So you can see a lot of the most recent ones are from outside of China. Uh, there were complaints about Singaporean data, but you can actually see some new Singaporean data has come out. You go back, and so the first, so then the other ones are Chinese, um, and more Chinese, and it shows you the originating lab, and but most of the the Chinese ones seem to be like government, government rather than universities, and then that's kind of for likely political reasons. So um, so then, so now I'm just gonna show like a really super duper bioinformatics for dummies because I'm a dummy myself. Um, like, so basically this is the kind of rabbit hole that you can go down. But if you wanna like scrutinize data sets, these are the like the really, really basic things. And I say this because I, I'm a dummy myself and haven't really, um, haven't really, you know, this is all stuff I was taught 15, 20 years ago and haven't used it much. So um, BLAST, the basic local alignment tool, it's, a, it's kind of the, the, the Google of molecular biology. Um, very quick, but very, but kind of dirty as well. And you need to sort of take that into account. And so it basically does alignments. Um, you can put in DNA, you can put in proteins, it can convert between the two of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so if, so here, this is the, so if I get, say, the, this was the very first um, sequence that was published. Um, from uh, China CDC Fudan. So, it, and so here you can see here are the proteins. 
here are and then the um this is the this is the rna sequence right so it's about thirty thousand letters in length and if you click faster that basically pulls out all of this kind of metadata stuff and um actually oh, there's a new version so if i click on current version um okay this is a newer one um if you click on on the actual organism. This is another way of browsing uh, coronaviruses. So you can see there's like 37 genomes. You can actually see the individual proteins as well. People have annotated um, the proteins of the organism. Um, here you go. Oh, okay. So you can see that this open reading frame, this nuclear capsid protein, about 420 base pairs in length. Um, so let me start right. So let me get this accession and, and I can stick it in. I can stick it in a uh, blast. So I'll do a basic blast search. And um, yeah. So you can paste all of that 30,000 letters, all of the proteins, or I'm just going to paste the accession number here. There's lots of different settings. This is very noisy. Uh, you can play around with the with the sensitivity, but I'm just going to do a standard thing because I don't know what I'm doing. And so now it's searching against all of the petabytes of data that's in their database, really. And so, but it's a short thing, so it shouldn't take a massive amount of time. And here we go. So um, we've got. Uh, so here we go. So obviously, the first things that come up are Wuhan. You know, other people have posted other Wuhan sequences. So the most you can see, like the uh, percentage, um, you know, the pay, pay percentage sequence similarity. This is a sequence similarity algorithm. So obviously, Wuhan. Virus is like number one. Some other Wuhan virus is 99.9% uh, similar. And then you start getting related coronaviruses. So here you've got uh, bats, bats, and um, which are kind of like down to 95, 94. And then you get the, the 2003 uh, SARS. So this is like 88%, 88, some more bats. Um, so yeah, and it, this is like the top hundred down to like some more bats at the bottom. Um, but but it, it can it can pick up. Like, it's really noisy, so you can like it, you can uh, get really um, down the kind of rabbit hole here. This is another view with um, looking at more uh, the, the kind of taxonomy with other. Species and the like, it's picking up some um, civet, civet SARS and um, compared to the similarity score. So BLAST is, yeah, quick, dirty, um, but, but kind of useful tool initially for these kind of single, single, uh, single alignments. And, and you, like, this graphic sum summary you can see here, um, you can see up here, like the Wu, it's just a hundred percent of the Wu hands here. Once you start getting to bats, there seems to be bits missing in this part of the genome. Then you get to like SARS and the like, and you've got more. You know, you've got more. The central chunk's the same, but you've got kind of differences in the middle, um, and sort of towards the edges. So um, yeah, that's that's your uh, single. That is your single alignment. So then, you know, you can you can start doing uh, multiple alignments. And the really basic tool for that is this thing called Clustal. The um, most recent version is Clustal Omega. And when you are, so when you, you know, for example, I was browsing like, oh, this nuclear capsid protein. And the, um, it, also, if you look at the, if you're sort of browsing the species, you know, okay, yeah, this, this, um, this uh okay i'm interested in this nuclear capsid because when you so when you were um if you're browsing the whole thing right 
um, yeah, so this uh, little capsid here, um, I can put it in faster. And so here's the like 419 base pairs. Uh, when I was browsing these other species, uh, you know, say the, okay, this bat looked interesting. This looked pretty close. So I can browse the, I can look at the bat sequence. Um, I can, okay, I'm getting it here. I can look at the bat proteins in the same manner and then go, uh, oh yeah, the nuclear capsids interesting in, in this. So I can get the, I can get the faster for that. And so I just basically need to stick these, stick this one. So I'm going to basically do a multiple alignment with, with my human, with the, with the Wuhan one. All right. And then I think, yeah, uh, let's look at the, this bat one must be the same, it must be the equivalent in bat. All right. Um, doing a bit of a cheat i've also got the uh human sars here so let's get the human sars sequence um and this is all like open this is all you know it's great it's all in the public domain 422 base pairs a little bit tiny bit longer but it must be the same yeah it's likely to be the same thing um and you can like this is me doing it the complete dummies way. You can do all of this stuff, pro you know, programmatically through APIs, through um, smart data science kind of ways. Um, and MERS, oh yeah, let's look at MERS, which is the Middle Eastern um, Middle Eastern virus that's kind of related. So I can then paste, all right, so I've got four different sequences here of like potentially related viruses, set parameters, I don't know what, I don't know, like, I'll just do the standard ones. And so then it does, so basically a bit like BLAST, this is uh, using another algorithm to do multiple alignments, takes a little while to um, do, but that here you go. So it's basically aligned them if you put the, let's put color on, so you can see the various amino acids acids and a lot of them line up but then there's various differences and it kind of there's various views but you can look at this as a as a tree to see um how so this is just in one you know one gene but you can see um so a m zero this this one so the top one is mares and then that in is closer to the SARS. So MERS and SARS when this a, a bit closer here. Then you've got the QH one is Wuhan and AA. Where this I think this other one is bat, right? So and then you can kind of tree another way too. And so this kind of looks at the relationships and you can kind of this is um and so these See my screen, guy. All right, so I'll just go into the work that I've been doing. I'm Ben Cowling. I'm a professor in epidemiology at Hong Kong New School of Public Health. And uh, a few weeks ago, I started getting quite interested in uh, the new coronavirus, probably in early January. Started initially to work on some publicly available data and then a couple of weeks ago, got the chance to collaborate with China CDC on some analysis uh, together with them. Um, so actually, we were invited, my, uh, my colleagues and I were invited to work with China CDC on the 22nd of January. We got hold of some data to work together with them on analysis on the 23rd. Having done the analysis, we submitted our paper to the New England Journal of Medicine on the 27th of January, and it was reviewed and then uh, accepted and published for very quickly. So within a week of us starting the analysis, we were able to share the results with uh, everyone else. Um, 
We didn't put this on a preprint server because we were expecting it to be able to, to come out very quickly. Uh, and actually the results did change slightly after we'd submitted the first version of the manuscript just because the data uh, are updated from day to day. Even the historical data sometimes get updated and corrected. So there's two questions I want to talk about today in uh, maybe the next 20 or 30 minutes. The first question that we'd like to know is how fast is infection spreading with the new coronavirus? In the earliest days of the epidemic, when information was first becoming available in early January 2020, we weren't sure whether the infection was spreading from person to person. Now, our understanding is that it does spread from person to person, and there have been quite a large number of infections in Wuhan. We've also seen infections exported to other cities in China and other parts of the world, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Japan, even further, Australia, United States, Canada, and Europe. What we don't yet know is whether infection has been spreading in those other parts of the world. Uh, we know for sure that infection had spread in Wuhan and has caused quite a large epidemic. The way that we can quantify uh, how fast infection spreads is with something called the reproductive number. That's the expected number of additional cases that one case will generate on average over the course of its infectious period. And when we look at the curve on the right hand side of the slide I'm showing, it seems to start very, very low, particularly with the cases that are not linked to the seafood market where the infections are thought to have begun. So the lighter color bars starting in December, there's not very many cases and then it gradually increases and we see what looks like an exponential increase going up to about the 8th of January is the peak on this figure and then coming down again. We need to be very careful because the right hand side of this figure is missing a lot of cases that maybe have in people who've become sick but haven't yet gone to hospital, haven't yet been tested, haven't yet been laboratory confirmed and the information hasn't been entered into the database that we used uh, for the analysis. So we focus just on the first part and I've tidied up, I've got rid of all the arrows uh, on this slide and then I've stuck on the top a black exponentially rising curve just with a black marker essentially so this is not a fitted curve this is just an illustration of the concept the black exponentially rising curve was fitted to the data from early december through to the fourth or the third of january sorry the third of january um, the black curve doesn't exactly match the bars that's not the point i just want to illustrate the idea that we're fitting here as an exponential curve from that exponential curve, we can work out what's the doubling time and what's the growth rate. So the epidemic's growing by 0.1 per day. It's doubling about every week. So that means if the incidence of infection is two per day today, then in seven days or 7.4 days, it'll be four per day. A week later, it'll be eight per day. A week later, it'll be 16 per day and on and so on. If we know the serial interval, that's the time between successive infections uh, or successive cases in a transmission chain, here we estimate it as about seven days. If we know the serial interval, we can also estimate what's called the reproductive number at the beginning of the epidemic, the basic reproductive number or the R0. So here we estimated that as 2.2. The implication of that is that on average, the earliest cases were spreading infection to 2.2 more people. And so the first case maybe spread it to a number of people uh, and then infection started and then each person was spreading it to 2.2 more people on average. Some may spread to more, some may spread to less. One of the questions we have about transmissibility is whether there's a lot of heterogeneity. So some people are spreading infection to many others and others may not be infectious at all. We've seen that kind of heterogeneity for SARS and for MERS, the other two coronaviruses that cause severe disease. What we'd like to do next though, and we haven't really done, and this data set is a little bit out of date now anyway, we like to see where the epidemic might be going next. So on this slide, I've moved the epidemic curve to the left. And on the right hand side of this slide, I show uh, one possible method that can be used for augmentation of recent cases that have not yet appeared in the data set. So the concept is if you see the blue arrow, essentially can we fill in all of the data in there so that we have 
probably still a rising incidence, a rising epidemic curve. Uh, we'll need an estimate of the onset to laboratory confirmation distribution. And then once we have that, we can kind of, it's called backfill or augment the epidemic curve. So the Van der Castile paper describes a way to do that. And that's something that we will try and maybe with also some more recent data from Wuhan or from other cities in China. And if we are unlucky in Hong Kong to have an epidemic here, then we'll also try some similar methods to project what's happening. I'll make one other comment at this point. We need to be very careful in looking at the epidemic curve from laboratory confirmed cases. If I go back, one of the reasons why we choose to focus on the earliest period is because that's when testing was relatively more focused on patients with pneumonia in the hospital. And a little bit later, testing was broadened also to capture mild cases. We know there's many, many more mild cases than severe cases with pneumonia. So although the virus is called uh, in China, the novel coronavirus uh, pneumonia, NCP, actually the majority of people who get coronavirus infection will not have pneumonia. We need to be careful about, about who's included in the laboratory uh, confirmed cases, because if there's a change in testing practices like there was in China to expand a little bit to mild cases, then what we'll see is uh, a more fast rise in confirmed cases compared to how fast the epidemic's really increasing. And we've seen some estimates in the in social media and even in med archive of reproductive numbers that are quite a bit higher than two perhaps because of failing to account for this change in testing practices in practice it's difficult to know how to account for that in hong kong i don't know what will happen if testing practices change and then it looks like there's a, a change in the case numbers um we need to to perhaps think of a way to get a more systematic sample of of patients who are being tested so that we can capture then the changes in incidence over time and capture the, uh, the epidemic as it progresses. Uh, one other thing is the exponential growth in the epidemic will only take place towards the beginning of an epidemic. As time goes on, uh, growth flattens out and then eventually will peak. So this exponential curve fitting is, uh, is a way to do things at the beginning of an epidemic but won't uh, can't do it forever because at some point the epidemic will stop growing exponentially. So that's one area. Uh, certainly if data become available from other cities in China, we haven't seen a lot of data uh, in the public domain from other cities in China, we could do similar uh, analyses. Um, we also need to be careful about the data from other cities in China to determine exactly who in those cities is being tested because for a time at least testing has been focused on uh, people with links to Wuhan, travelers from Wuhan, or people who've visited Wuhan on work for work, uh, and then their family members and close contacts. Um, so if testing has been broadened or will be broadened to uh, the general community, we might see case numbers begin to agree increase again. And I've seen some speculation on social media that the reason numbers have flattened out, numbers of confirmed cases have flattened out, in recent weeks is because of some kind of saturation of testing. I'm not sure that's the case. I wonder whether it's more to do with who is being tested and who is not being tested. In that analysis published in New England Journal of Medicine, we also looked at some of the characteristics of, of uh, infections. So the top left panel in the figure is the incubation period, on average, maybe six days from illness onset, so from infection to illness onset, and then a right tail that goes up to around 14 days. On the top right is a serial interval that I mentioned earlier. We thought on average is about seven days. Actually, now there's some emerging evidence that the serial interval might be a bit shorter than seven days, it might be closer to six days, actually. Um, but, but no published evidence for that yet. And then the other two panels are just some data on the delay distribution, illness onset to medical visit, and then the right-hand side, illness onset hospitalization, which is about 10 days in the earliest 400 cases. Um, and that's an indication of the lag times between when people start to have symptoms and then when they eventually get into the hospital and probably get tested, typically 10 days. So there was some social media uh, inquiries from this paper about, if I go back, uh, why was the transmission in Wuhan not recognized in December? And that's because the information from December wasn't available until mid to late January. So although this epidemic curve shows the, the timing goes back to December, the information available was, was lagged quite substantially uh, and only really available middle and late January. 
for this figure. So that was the first thing, transmissibility. And if we can understand transmissibility, it helps us to, to understand where the epidemic might go next, how much longer it might last, uh, and how many people might be infected. The second issue I want to talk about is severity. So there's been a lot of confusion about the severity of the novel coronavirus and how it compares to SARS and MERS and influenza and other things. And it's not helpful in general to talk about the confirmed uh, cases fatality risk. At the moment, we're tracking it in China, maybe 2.1% uh, for a number of days recently. That number is not very meaningful. It's much easier to place the severity of novel coronavirus in the context of SARS and MERS and other things, if we think instead about what's the hospital fatality risk, so what's the risk of fatality for people who are hospitalized, maybe with pneumonia or with some other more serious uh, disease caused by coronavirus. Secondly, what's the case fatality risk among all symptomatic cases, whether or not they, they seek outpatient care. And then thirdly, on the right-hand side of this figure, what's the infection fatality risk which is the fatality risk among all infected persons. And so let me see if I've got anything. Okay, so for SARS, let me give some context. For SARS, the hospital fatality risk was about 10 to 15%, depending on which country. Um, and the case fatality risk and the infection fatality risk were essentially the same because we are not aware of any milder or asymptomatic SARS infections or a, a very small number anyway. So essentially, for people infected with SARS coronavirus, the risk of fatality was maybe 10 to 15%. Uh, in China, it was a little bit lower. In other parts of the world, a little bit higher. For MERS, the hospital fatality risk has been even higher than that. And again, we're not aware of milder cases or asymptomatic cases in general. For both SARS and MERS, the hospital fatality risk is higher uh, in older age. So older adults who got SARS or MERS tend to fare worse than younger adults, but still the risk of fatality was significant even for younger adults, including healthcare workers. There were healthcare workers who died of SARS and MERS. If we think instead about influenza for seasonal influenza, we know the hospital fatality risk is probably in the range of five to 10%, so lower than SARS, and that's for people with, influ uh, sorry, with pneumonia caused by seasonal influenza, which is not that common. The symptomatic case fatality risk, so if you or I got uh, symptomatic influenza in the flu season, what's our chance of dying? Uh, our age, probably less than one in 10,000. It's really typically a very mild infection. And then for the infection fatality risk, we think that some influenza infections are asymptomatic or so mild that we wouldn't notice the symptoms, maybe a sore throat for a few days or something. So the infection fatality risk can be much lower for influenza than for SARS and MERS. There's one exception for influenza, and that's 1918 pandemic influenza, where it's thought that maybe 1% of infected people died worldwide. And that, of course, was 100 years ago with malnutrition uh, and lack of, um, lack of food and access to healthcare, partly because of the, the war that had just finished in 1918. And the conditions back then were, were different in many parts of the world. Okay, so putting coronavirus, novel coronavirus in context, SARS and MERS have very high uh, case fatality rates, maybe 10, 15% for SARS, higher for MERS, and then influenza is much lower. So how do we think about coronavirus? As I was saying, th this illustrates the problem with early data for SARS. So this paper was published after SARS, when in the earliest stages of the epidemic, there were serious underestimates of the ultimate fatality risk of SARS. I mentioned to you that the fatality risk of SARS in Hong Kong was between 10 and 15%. So the black dots on this slide for each of the dates are just tracking what would ultimately happen to the patients that had been admitted by those dates. So ultimately the case fatality risk was about 13, 14% over through time. But if we look at the simple estimate, uh, which is the diamond, the black diamond, it starts off very low. That's taking the confirmed deaths divided by, sorry, the deaths divided by the cases. So just like with the novel coronavirus, in the earlier stage of SARS in Hong Kong, the case fatality rate or the hospital fatality rate was tracking around 2%. And then over time, as cases resolved, and uh, typically time from illness onset to death was about a month 
So as cases were admitted and then in hospital for a while, and then some of them unfortunately were fatal, we see the case fatality rate appear to track upwards. It didn't really get worse. The problem is if we just look at deaths divided by cases, we're going to underestimate the fatality risk in the earliest parts of the epidemic. So this paper by Asragani and others in 2005 illustrated a number of different methods that could be used to, to allow for those lags in time to death. Uh, one of the methods, the most simple, is probably just taking the deaths divided by the deaths plus recoveries. And in China, they have been uh, reporting recoveries to some extent. Um, among the confirmed cases. In the earliest part of coronavirus outbreak, we tracked the hospital fatality risk and estimated that it was around 14% with an uncertainty bound up to about 30, 30 or more percent. So that hospital fatality risk is perhaps consistent with SARS, uh, a little bit more serious than influenza. But what we don't have information on is the symptomatic case fatality risk or the infection fatality risk. And that's really one of the biggest gaps that we have at the moment with the novel coronavirus. We have a fear that the case, the symptomatic case fatality risk might be quite a bit higher than influenza. But obviously, we know there are many mild infections. Most of the cases detected outside of China are mild. Um, so we know there must be a lot of mild cases. So um, this is my last slide, I think. We'd like to know about transmissibility in different locations. We'd like to know about severity. How many mild cases are there for every severe case? Is it 10 to 100, 1,000 to 1? Because that makes a massive difference in the, the government response. At the moment, the response in Hong Kong and some other places um, indicates that the health authorities believe the severity is more like 1918 influenza than like seasonal influenza. We haven't seen a lot of published estimates of severity yet. Uh, we presume that health authorities have access to information that may not yet have been published. And perhaps if those health authorities are acting rationally, then one might presume they have evidence that the severity is towards 1918 uh, influenza severity. But we will need to wait and see whether uh, any such estimates come out uh, in the near future. One of the fascinating features of the new coronavirus is that children don't seem to be affected, at least don't seem to have severe disease. Among the first 425 cases in the New England paper that I mentioned, no, there were no cases in children. Now, uh, I think about 1% of all of the lab confirmed cases are children. So it's really very surprising that children don't feature. And in SARS and MERS, there's also very few children uh, with those coronaviruses, but that's completely the opposite to, for example, seasonal flu, where children have higher attack rates than other age groups. And then the last question I want to mention is how effective have different interventions been to date, whether it's the travel restrictions, the quarantine of cities in central China, the border screening in, intended to delay the introduction of infections and maybe delay local epidemics, but not prevent them, just delay them. Mm, face mask use in, in communities like Hong Kong, and then massive social distancing again in Hong Kong and southern cities in China and in Southeast Asia. So how effective are these different interventions? And if infections were to spread to other countries and begin local epidemics there, what could we tell them about what works or does not work? Opportunities because of uh, the topic of this webinar, um, I think there's some really interesting information to be learned from cruise ship outbreaks or other outbreaks in closed settings. For example, how many infections really have there been? And then what's the severity profile of those infections? In the cruise ship in Japan, I think it's more than 60 infections now, um, mostly mild. If any of those infections were to turn severe, it would give us um, uh, maybe an indication of, of how the, the ratio of mild to severe cases um, I've seen a lot of crowdsourced data. One link is on this slide. I think there's others as well, trying to gather as much information as possible on the lab confirmed cases. I think a time is coming when counting laboratory confirmed cases will no longer be sustainable or useful. And we need to think of other ways to, to monitor the spread of the outbreak, maybe with some uh, online symptom reporting portals or some other approaches to surveillance 
with defined populations in hospitals or in outpatient clinics or just in the general community because lab testing probably won't be able to keep pace with the number of infections that we might expect from a highly transmissible virus like the new coronavirus. Um, and then there's very interesting publicly available tools like EpiRisk, uh, which you can Google, and then that was used on the right-hand side to show what's the risk of importation to different countries, maybe at, at different points in time, um, saying that the United Kingdom was likely to get a case Yeah, I think so. So there's there's a lot of crowdsourced data on incubation periods. There was a paper in Eurosurveillance very recently on that. I don't think we need a lot more information on the incubation period at this stage. For serial intervals, now there's contact tracing going on in different countries. I saw a very nice diagram from the Singapore Ministry of Health uh, linking together some cases. If onset dates are available for those, then we can also start to look at serial intervals. Um, I, one, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, serial intervals, reproductive numbers, etc., are not necessarily biological properties of the virus itself. It's properties of the virus in a population. So serial intervals may not be the same in Singapore as in Hong Kong, may not be the same in the United States if infection spreads there. And the reproductive number could be quite different in Hong Kong versus Wuhan, and could be quite different in New York versus uh, New Jersey, for example, because of different densities of population, uh, different social contact patterns, maybe different survival of the virus in the environment, etc. So just because we have estimates from Wuhan, that doesn't mean we, we need to stop. I think we need to keep looking. For Hong Kong specifically, if we can start to gather data when cases maybe increase in number on uh, uh, linked cases, serial intervals between those, um, that, that would be helpful. And then, as I was mentioning earlier, in order to understand how fast infection is spreading, we really need a consistent impression of uh, case numbers. I think the laboratory cases will be misleading in the end, and then tens, and then hundreds, and then potentially thousands. No, so there's no, no similar thing back in SARS. Uh, the EpiRisk is just um, a web platform that uses the global flight data to, to look at how infections might spread around the world if they start in a single place. Um, and then maybe an extension to that in the future would be if some parts of the world are more heavily affected, like Southeast Asia, what's then the risk to, to less well-connected places to Southeast Asia, like North and then South America, and so on. Um, for data in Hong Kong, I haven't seen a lot of detailed information. I've seen nice websites with case numbers, just confirmed case numbers and the location of people in quarantine and so on. Um, but we're going to need more than that in the coming weeks if infections start to spread. So someone mentioned, I think maybe this is both of you, but... Uh... You know, there's a lot of people trying to be clever online and say, I think you mentioned this, Ben, as well in one of your slides about, um, you know, people are saying, oh, well, it's just it's just like flu. Flu kills a lot of people. So what's the big deal? So what, what, what would you say in response to that? So in terms of the way it's spread, we think it is like flu. People are mostly infectious around the time of illness onset, so as mild as flu. And given that two of the cases uh, outside mainland China have been fatal uh, of around 200, uh, we wouldn't expect that with seasonal flu. So it makes us somewhat concerned. Um, and I, you know, I, I think we'd really like to see more information on 
how many mild cases there are for the severe cases in China. We haven't seen that because testing has been focused on severe cases. Right. And then outside of China, they're just in the numbers yet, you know, only 200 or so lab confirmed cases. Right. Uh, when those numbers increase further, I think we'll have a better idea. And how, how do we get more recovered cases, actually? Because uh, you talk about lab confirmed cases. Um, you know, I, I also noticed that we're not getting that many numbers around recovered cases. So it, will we be able to get more of those at some point or why don't we have mm. more right now? Yeah, in, in China, I'm not sure what exactly is the process for reporting cases as recovered. I know that the process for notifying cases is when there's a, a patient with a laboratory positive result for Corona virus then it gets entered into the system because it's notifiable by law and if that patient unfortunately died then the record has to be updated to indicate that they've died but if the patient's recovered i'm not sure if the same rules apply and it may be that there's a lot of recover cases in china that haven't that the information hasn't been entered into the system mm -hmm. yet maybe it'll be entered at a later date so we're probably relying more on information from outside of china but then I heard very recently that even in other parts of the world, recovered cases haven't really been been reported and the information shared in a systematic way, you know, whether it's from Europe or North America or or anywhere else. Um, I think it, it's not clear how the best way to do that. What's the best way to do that, mm. perhaps? Mm. Okay, let me just see. Um, I think we're coming towards, I think actually we've gone over time, but uh, uh, I think actually I, w I want to mention one thing. So you mentioned the uh, the cruise ship. I think now this, uh, as I also mentioned, it's the second most uh, infected country in the world because <laughs> there were sixty one cases. So I think I think you did mention this. So um, that could be a nice case study, right? Because I think they're testing um, everyone on the ship, and definitely the whole crew. I think would that be a, a really good way of getting um, some numbers around um, you know the, the fatality ratios and i mean not anyone's died from the cruise ship as far as i'm aware but you know the other numbers would that be useful yeah so it would give a bound on severity about how many how many severe cases there were for or how many mild cases for every severe case i don't know if any of those 61 were severe um maybe there would also be indications from the uh, maybe tracing the people's movements on the cruise ship maybe indications about how the virus was spreading there's a fear that it might uh that that the virus might be able to spread through contaminated environments, meaning that people don't need to be in proximity to each other to spread, that an infected person could pass through an area, leave the virus behind in the environment, and then other people could come in later and get infected. Mm. But then again, with a reproductive number of about two, it doesn't seem like this infection is highly contagious, mm. different to maybe measles or, or something like that, right. where uh, you know one person can infect a lot. So maybe... I don't know. I think we could learn a lot from a more detailed investigation of the cruise ship. And I hope that information will be forthcoming on what happened on the ship and who were the infected people. Did they have a lot of interactions with each other? Were they in cabins next to each other, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. yeah, I hope so too. Okay. Uh, so I think just one last question. Uh, uh, well, two questions, but I'll put them together <laughs> to save time. So someone did ask uh, about, for example, India, you know, very, very large country. Um, and yet doesn't seem to have that many cases yet. Should they still be worried? You know, I mean, I, I think so because if it continues spreading, but I want to hear your opinion from either of you. Uh, and then relatedly, people are asking, okay, look, is there a turning point, right? Some people are saying now that the number of cases is, is falling, but what does that really mean uh, for the layman? Does that mean we, you know, we've, we've already reached the turning point or not? So if you could answer these, these questions together, uh, maybe Ben first. Okay, so for India and for other countries with relatively less laboratory capacity, uh, I think we'll see less laboratory confirmed cases. Mm. So we'll see less cases from India, we'll see less cases from maybe Indonesia than we will from um, other countries in the region with relatively more laboratory capacity. And we've already seen that in the travel related cases uh, that, for example, Thailand and Indonesia don't seem to have reported as many cases as one might expect from the the strength of links with Wuhan. Mm, um, okay, interesting. Whether they should be worried or not really depends on severity. If it turns out that this infection is like seasonal flu, then I think they'll be as worried as they are with seasonal flu epidemics. Um, but if it turns out to be more serious, 
then I think everyone's going to be worried whether or not they have lab capacity for, for testing. And so with SARS, laboratory testing was an essential component mm. of controlling outbreaks and epidemics because you need to figure out who's the SARS patients and then isolate them. Right. Uh, there may not be capacity to, to isolate every patient with pneumonia. But for this coronavirus, isolation and quarantine are uh, relatively of less public health importance because infections are spreading in the community right. before, during, and soon after illness onset. So whether or not you isolate people later in their illness when they're hospitalized doesn't make so much difference for transmission. Um, and quarantine, I would say, probably has limited value because you can't quarantine everybody who's going to end up uh, showing signs and symptoms of infection and then spreading onwards in the community. In terms of your second question, um, if we just think about infectious diseases in general, new infectious diseases in general, uh, if they have a reproductive number of two and nothing's done to control spread, then epidemics will peak when more than half of the population have been infected and they probably won't peak until then. Uh, in the case of this coronavirus, we know there's been a lot of public health measures in mm. place mm. to slow transmission, maybe to reduce transmission, hopefully to reduce the reproductive number. So it's quite possible that epidemics would peak in Wuhan or other places uh, without 50% of people having been infected. Um, but in general, the modeling results that I've seen so far, including papers on MedArchive, suggest that Wuhan epidemic may not have peaked yet. And um, even if it's uh, flattening out a bit, it may still have a way to go before it's over. Uh, the, the earlier modeling results, like from my colleagues in Hong Kong, you suggested yeah. Wuhan epidemic could peak in a couple of weeks. Right. If it's been slowed down by public health measures, then it's just delaying the peak. It means it's going to go off for longer. And then at the other side of the peak, you have as far to go on side in the epidemic curve. So if it peaks in a couple of weeks in Wuhan, it's still going to, infection is still going to be going on for another sure. couple of months, I guess. Hmm. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting stuff. So I think, yeah, I think we'll, 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 we'll end it there. Do you want to say anything, uh, Scott? Uh, I think it was interesting what you said around the data as well. Do you want to uh, add to that or whatever else you want to say? Um, well, not really. I'm not an epidemiologist, <laughs> so no, I indeed. can't really, uh, but around, I don't know, of course, I but around the virology, I thought, uh, I well, not sorry, not the virology, the, the genetic data. Um, I think you did mention at the end of your at the end of your talk around, you know, you want more data, but how how are we going to get it? <laughs> I think Ben also wants more data. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a shame that there's nothing out, nothing coming from Hong Kong because that that will ha really help understand about you know is Wuhan like where where are the twenty nine people or whatever that got it? Where, like where did they get it from? How if they can't if they can't track, you know, um, link it to uh, to anyone from Wuhan, are they getting it from Guangdong? Are they getting it from, um, uh, you know, anywhere yeah. else? So yeah. that's um, yeah. All right, I think that's that, the yeah. takeaway then from this uh, this whole session. You know, without data, we can't do very much, right? So, uh, yeah. So I want to thank you both. Um, that was, I thought it was extremely interesting, and I hope uh, the viewers did too. Um, if there's any questions, I'll pass it on, and of course, you give me your slides, so I'll share them. So I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Ben Cowling, and. Dr. Scott Edmonds for your amazing uh, insights. I think uh, there's so much rubbish talked about this online as we discussed. So it's good to have some uh, science uh, and rational talk about it. So, so thank you again for your time. And talk to you soon. Good. Thanks, right, for now. Thanks again. All right.